Right, um, a very good evening uh, to you all. Lovely to see you. Uh, welcome uh, to the LSE if you're not normally here, and if you are normally here, welcome anyway. Uh, my name is Tony Travers. Um, uh, I'm the Associate Dean in the School of Public Policy and a professor in the Government Department. And uh, this evening, we're going to hear both of us a short present presentation about this book, The Strange Survival of Liberal Britain, from its author, Professor Sir Vernon Bogdanov. Congratulations, by the way, Vernon. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a, a respondent in the show, uh, who is Polly McKenzie, who current, or today works at the University of the Arts London, a sister institution um, based in various in places around the city. Um, and, but who was policy director, I got that last time, for the uh, then leader of the Liberal Democrats, um, Nick Clegg, so I've got that. Anyway, I've got the details of the event to come next. So, um, about the event. So we're going to hear from Vernon first, uh, and then a response from Polly, and then I'll, one or two questions, then we'll open it out to, to all of you. Um, for Twitter users, the hashtag for today's event is the thing I always forget to read out is hashtag LSE Public Policy. Um, and the event is being recorded. There are people watching online, so be alert to that. And uh, you can order the book, The Strange Survival of Liberal Britain, UK Delivery Only, from our official, official LSE events independent bookshop, Pages of Hackney and presumably in other means besides. You mustn't be uh, monopolistic about these things. Now, I don't want to say more about the book than this. It's an intriguing thesis that, uh, to summarise it, and I don't summarise it in, in advance of the um, author of the book summarising, but taking the, 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 the notion that far from um, liberal England having died, uh, but that the ideas and the radicalism of, radi of liberal thinking in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, have effectively been much more powerful than that and have lived on to today. And I've got a number of questions I would like to uh, ask them about that, and I will uh, after he has said uh, some words to introduce the book, probably rather greater length than I just have. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Tony, and thank you for asking me to speak, and thank you for coming on a cold... Winter's evening. I should say, because one or two reviewers have got this wrong, Tony, of course, didn't. This is a book about liberal political culture, the strange survival of that, not about the survival of the Liberal Party. It, it's not about that at all. Now, uh, let me first answer the question of why I've written the book. And I hope that no one asks that question after reading it. But I mean, I thought perhaps I ought to say is anyone who's written the book, I think, would agree with Winston Churchill, who's actually one of the heroes of the book. But he said that writing a book is an adventure. To begin with, it is a toy, then an amusement, then it becomes a mistress, and then it becomes a master, and then it becomes a tyrant, and in the last stage, just as you are about to be reconciled to your servitude, you kill the monster and fling him to the public. <laughs> now, the reason I wrote the book on this period was I think these were the years when the foundations of modern Britain were laid, and I think the problems that the late Victorians and Edwardians faced were very similar to the problems we face today. And they didn't, it's fair to say, solve a lot of the problems, but then we haven't either. And I wanted to find out how Britain reacted in the years when her political system and her global supremacy were challenged, and challenged in a number of ways the seemingly stable system was being battered by new forces. The first was that an aristocratic system was being transformed into a mass system, a democratic system, if you like. Outsiders were clamouring to get in, in particular organised labour, and also women who, of course, during this period did not have the vote. There was secondly an ideological challenge that traditional liberalism which was based on limited government at home and non-intervention abroad, was being challenged by new ideas involving a greater role for the state. And even before my period began, one liberal statesman, Sir William Harcourt, declared in 1887 
we are all socialists now. He didn't necessarily mean by that we all believe in nationalisation, but we all believe in a greater role for the state. Thirdly, we were challenged by rising powers with different political philosophies. Britain had lost her industrial leadership by this time to the United States and Germany. And economic historians still argue about the reasons why, but it seems plausible to suppose the first industrial nation couldn't keep her supremacy forever. And because of this, the economy came into the forefront of political debate where it still remains. Now, in the 19th century, what happened at Westminster and what happened in the economy were in two separate compartments, neither influencing the other. And Westminster was dominated by constitutional, political and religious issues. But in the 20th century, by contrast, politics and the economy came to be intertwined. And Westminster today is dominated by socio-economic issues, economic management and social welfare. And the Constitution, and sadly for the sale of my books, has fallen into the background. <coughs> and finally, the period saw the introduction of the social question into British politics. Now, at the turn of the century, William Beveridge, who of course became director of the LSE, and was going to be the author of the famous report on social insurance in 1944, at the turn of the century, he was told by the head of his Oxford College, when you have learned all that Oxford can teach you, then one thing that needs doing is to go and discover why, with so much wealth in Britain, there continues to be so much poverty, and how poverty can be cured. And inequalities of income and wealth, it seemed, were not divinely ordained, but could be altered by political action. So these are the problems of 1895 to 1914. Economic modernization, social welfare and inequality, also secondary and technical education, a new role for Britain in the world, a new political agenda which still dominates our um, politics. Now, the years after 1895 saw a reaction, as I said, against traditional liberalism, the liberalism of the small state at home and non-intervention abroad. And many believed that the answer to the new challenges could be summed up in one word, organisation. And there was an emphasis on pushing society in a more collectivist direction and organising the empire into a more united force. And many of the debates about the empire, imperial federation, can be paralleled today in debates about the European Union and the possible federation of Europe and whether Britain should be part of it. And the policies, the organisational policies, could be summed up in the slogan national efficiency. And in 1903, Joseph Chamberlain was famously to propose that Britain abandon her long tradition of free trade, and that initiated a debate on Britain's economic future, which resonates even today. Now, in my book, there, there are a number of myths which I try and destroy, and in no particular order, they are as follows. But the delay in giving women the vote was almost entirely due to male prejudice and misogyny. And I don't deny that those factors existed, but I think they weren't the crucial ones in the delay in giving women the vote. The second one was that the Labour Party was in a position to overtake the Liberals in 1914. It was a minor pressure group attached to the tail of the Liberal Party, and the Liberals could at any time have destroyed the Labour Party by uh, competing against it in the constituencies. There was a kind of informal electoral pact between the two parties, and most Liberals had no idea that Labour might replace it. And if you were going to predict before the First World War what would happen, you would think that Asquith would retire eventually and be replaced by Lloyd George, and Lloyd George would then be replaced by Ramsay MacDonald, the leader of a single progressive party. A uh, further myth is that contrary to what Christopher Clarke writes in his very influential book, The Sleepwalkers, it's wrong to suggest that the powers, including Britain, sleepwalked into the war. And another uh, one related to the war is that contrary to what Neil Ferguson writes in his equally influential book, The Pity of War, it's wrong to suggest that had Britain kept out of the war, she could have secured an honoured place in the Kaiser's European 
Union. Now, for the main, perhaps, myth that I try to combat is that Britain was near to civil war in 1914. It is, admittedly, a paradox that as the franchise was widened, the legitimacy of the Constitution came to be threatened. And some have argued that the Constitution was under such threat in 1914 that Britain's liberal society was near to collapse. And the threat came, uh, apparently, from four different directions. Firstly, the radical right of the Conservative Party. Second, the suffragettes. Thirdly, organised labour, the trade unions. And fourthly, what was said to be the most serious, uh, from Ulster. And one historian has argued that these factors slowly undermined England's parliamentary structure until, but for the providential intervention of a world war, it would certainly have collapsed. Now, I, I don't believe that uh, for a moment. It's fair to say that the Conservative campaign guide, they were called the Unionists then, uh, written in preparation for the supposed general election after 1914, said that the government had smashed the Constitution and that no method remains except armed revolt by which the country can make its will prevail. It predicted the blood of civil war. But I think Ulster was only a threat if she could command support from this side of the Irish Sea. And by 1914, this was becoming doubtful. And the Unionists were very worried as to the international implications of the Ulster conflict and fearful that enemy powers might take advantage of it. On the 15th of March, 1914, one of the Unionist leaders, Austin Chamberlain, noted in his diary that the extraordinary Austro-German outburst of feeling against Russia at this moment is not wholly divorced from the spectacle of our domestic difficulties and that if for any reason our participation were impossible, Germany might provoke a quarrel with Russia or France. And then he told a meeting of Unionist leaders he would like to offer the government the alternative for provincial councils or federal home rule on the South African mode as a safe settlement. And Asquith uh, reported at that time to his girlfriend, he wrote daily letters to his girlfriend, Venetia Stanley, uh, which are a wonderful commentary on events. I mean, it, it includes war, wartime secrets, and they, they went by letter to her every day. The postal service was then much more efficient. He said at one, writing one cabinet meeting, I'd better send the letter now, or it won't reach you in the East End of London tonight. <laughs> And he said, the Tories are thoroughly cowed over this army business. They think it is going to do them harm in the country. And the Conservatives, I think, would not have pressed the Ulster issue if they thought it would lose domestic support. But you also have to ask, what would Ulster be rebelling against? By August 1914, her right to exclusion had been accepted by Liberals, who had introduced an amending act into the home rule proposals, allowing counties to opt out. So the dispute was now confined to two issues. Firstly, the length of time which they could opt out, but that was a bogus issue because no one was going to force Ulster into United Ireland after five or six years or whatever. And the other issue was the borders of the new Ulster, and in particular, the argument about Tyrone and Fermanagh. But as Lloyd George was later to put it, men would die for the empire, but not for Tyrone and for Manor. <laughs> and there would have been riots in Ulster, and it may be the border would have been settled by force, but the fighting would not have spread to this side of the Irish Sea, and there would not have been a civil war, because the public would not have, would have asked itself why unionists were proposing to fight for something that had in principle already been conceded. And so unionists would not have supported armed rebellion against an act of parliament which gave Ulster most of what it sought, and the public would not have supported it either. And um, the Unionists, I think, were well aware of the weakness of their position. So the British parties, I think, were far closer in Irish matters than I would care to admit for a generation past. And the extremist rhetoric of the Tories had paradoxically forced a compromise solution. Now, uh, when the um, uh, war broke out, the Irish nationalist leader, Redmond, spoke in the Commons in support of the war. And he said the government could take all British troops out of Ireland, <coughs> nationalists would defend it, joining with Ulsterman to do so. And unionists cheered and waved their order papers. 
The Foreign Secretary said the one bright spot in the dreadful situation is Ireland. On 18th of September, the day on which Parliament was prorogued, Labour MP Will Crooks asked MPs to sing God Save the King. The Irish Nationalists joined in and Crooks cried out, God Save Ireland! To which the Irish Nationalist leader replied, and God Save England too. And they said that the first time, Redmond said, the Irish leader, for over a hundred years, I feel Ireland's interests are precisely the same as yours. She feels and will feel the British democracy has kept faith with her. She knows this is a just war. She is moved in a very special way by the fact this war is undertaken in the defense of small nations and oppressed people, including the Serbia and Belgium. And so the Irish question, in my opinion, was almost solved in 1914. And uh, the Home Rule Bill had won tremendous goodwill for Britain amongst nationalists. But it was too late. After the war, the more radical voices of Sinn Féin were heard, and Ireland broke off from the rest of Britain. And whereas John Redmond supported the war effort in 1914, De Valera in 1939 did not, and that was a very tragic missed opportunity to conciliate Ireland. Now, the answer to my question, and I come to conclude here, of how Britain responded to the new challenges, is that it was the robustness of Britain's parliamentary and political institutions with a commitment to radical debate and argument which carried the country through one of the most turbulent periods of its history. And the pre-1914 attack on liberalism was to prove superficial and lacking in firm roots. And while the war destroyed liberals in many countries on the continent, uh, it did not destroy um, uh, liberalism in Britain. And Britain, almost alone in the continent between the wars, remained immune from fascism and communism, both of which had very little support between the wars. Now, I was asked by one friend what lessons could be drawn from the book. And the purist might say there are no lessons to be drawn from history. And I once heard that great historian A.J.P. Taylor saying that history teaches us not to make the old mistakes, so it leaves us free to make new ones instead. <laughs> but let me give some lessons. The first is the Edwardians were right to carry out social reform with incentives as the National Insurance Act of 1911 did. I think that was absolutely uh, crucial. But there are also, I fear, some negative lessons. We must not, as the Edwardians did, neglect education, particularly technical education. But I now come to the great failure of the Edwardian liberals they failed in defence and foreign policy because they neglected our national defences and they did not always remember that our defence and foreign policy are bound up with the continent. Before 1914, our defence policy was that of an insular and maritime country relying on the empire, not of a continental power. And therefore, we had a very small army and a lot of People, if, if I may say so, I've noticed a lot of students think about 1914 and 1939, think of Britain as a great military power. Britain had about six divisions in the army in, in 1914 and not many more in 1939. And when we were negotiating, trying to negotiate a pact with the Russians, Stalin asked how many divisions we would have to put in the field against Nazi Germany. And the reply was four divisions. And Stalin said, well, the Soviet Union has 300, so that makes 304. And uh, we had what Lord Kitchener called a town clerk's army. And Bismarck very famously said, if the British army landed in Hamburg, he'd get the police to arrest it. <laughs> now, and this meant that um, uh, we could not, in effect, oppose uh, the German um, uh, attack in 1914. But if we could not afford to allow Germany to control the coasts of France and Belgium, the Channel ports and so on, then Britain was not only a maritime and imperial power, but also a European power. And the navy alone was insufficient to deal with it. And the liberals, like most people in Britain, were very hostile to a large army, which probably meant conscription. And that meant 1939 also. But the lesson I drew from the book, which is one I did not like to draw at all, 
was that the blimps, the people on the right, were absolutely right, correct, and that if Britain had had a large army, that might have been a deterrent to German aggression, both in 1914 and 1939. Very few people were calling for it, only those on the extreme right and the army leaders, and they were written off as old-fashioned blimps. But in my view, and I say this very sadly, uh, I think that was the only way in which war could have been avoided. But I don't want to conclude on a pessimistic or um, negative note. So let me conclude in this way. But domestically, the central problem that faced Britain in these years was how to bring new groups within the pale of the Constitution to achieve universal suffrage so that women and, uh, and unenfranchised men have a vote, to ensure the representative chamber, the House of Commons, prevailed over the unrepresentative one, the Lords, to construct institutions which, which would conciliate Ireland, and above all, to bring the working class into the political system, and to achieve all this without sacrificing the liberal values which had characterised Victorian Britain. And with the exception of Ireland, all these were to be peacefully resolved after 1914 amidst general acceptance. And even in the case of Ireland, there was, as I've tried to say, a good chance that home rule combined with exclusion would remove the long-standing grievances of those living in Ireland. Now, in 1920, the departing French ambassador, Paul Cambon, who'd been in Britain for about 25 years and helped negotiate the Entente Cordiale, told Winston Churchill, in the 20 years I have been here, I have witnessed an English revolution more profound and searching than the French Revolution itself. The governing class had been almost entirely deprived of political power and to a very large extent of their property and estates. And this has been accomplished almost imperceptibly and without the loss of a single life. And Churchill said, I suppose this is true. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, that's it. Very good. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> Holly, uh, if you sort of ruminate, think having heard Vernon's take on... Ruminate. Yes, and the, the um, ideas you just heard. Um, so I think, um, I feel massively underpowered for this discussion as I'm not a constitutional historian. Um, and also I'm very intimidated by Vince uh, in front of me who knows a lot more about lots of things than I do to do with liberalism. But I'll just give it a go. Um, so I guess what intrigues me about the, the period um, is that amazing disruptive change in our way of governing ourselves that Vernon articulates so beautifully um, as, as I, you know, I, I remain interested, enormously enthusiastic about the need for reform now and, and so often feel a sense of despair and paralysis about the capacity of our institutions to update themselves, to respond to, to pressure. We feel, it feels so often in our political discourse, like people talk about, you know, oh, the Palace of Westminster has been there for a thousand years, we mustn't change anything. And it, it's, I think, important to remind ourselves about what complete nonsense that is. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the increases in suffrage uh, that, we ha that, that we went through during, um, you know, the late 19th and early 20th century were a truly remarkable transformation. It always feels to me that, um, that legacy of the Industrial Revolution and that democratization, what you know, people now talk about in terms of new power, and its ability to then feed through into governance is something that we, we struggle so much with. And I, I, wonder, I wonder why that is, even though, obviously, Bernard's just told us we're not allowed to draw any lessons from history. Um, why, you know, you look at, for example, I don't know, um, constitutional amendments to the, the US Constitution, and, and they used to be sort of quite regular, and now there aren't any. Uh, we, again, there's, there, there, there were constitutional reforms under uh, the Blair government, um, but uh, Vince will remember, uh, perhaps, Nick Clegg gave a speech announcing we were going to have a great Reform Act level of uh, 
political and constitutional reform under the coalition, and um, we didn't. It went a little bit wrong. You know, the House of Lords reforms were completely destroyed by parliamentary process. The AV referendum was a complete catastrophe. And, and I, I, I wonder about how to, um, how to build back, I guess, a process that enables institutions to reform much more slowly and from within. Um, what is it that led to that acceptance rather than the resistance that you get? We were talking in the green room very briefly earlier about uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher, a period of history I know a lot more about, but, um, and, and the Falklands War and this, this the, the way that history has turned Thatcher into a figure of just absolute no compromise ever. And that, that caricature of her as somebody who just brinkmanship with the unions, brinkmanship with the Argentinians, when it's then played back by you know, Liz Truss just last year, it doesn't work because actually there's so much more is needed. Uh, so much more kind of uh, collaboration, compromise. Uh, it, it's only after a decade that you get that, the, the brinkmanship and even then it's only at the margins rather than, rather than everywhere. Um, People often talk, don't they, about this, the way that the, the you know, the, the fourth industrial revolution, this transformation of power through the internet, through, uh, uh, through the kind of the potential of AI, ought to lead to constitutional upheaval. Um, and I, at, at the moment, I, I don't know, I don't know how it can or will, uh, it feels like such a stuck period for the country. And I thought I was coming here to talk about liberalism, so I might as well say something about that as well, which is that, you know, it's a fascinating thought, right, this idea that actually liberalism survived, even though the Liberal Party was so, so denuded by that kind of post-war period. Um, and it is clear to me that the ideas are so much more pervasive than the institutions, the parties that try to hold them. And, and so often parties adapt, they adopt entire new philosophies as if they were their own. And you know, we see the Conservative Party you know, struggling so much at the moment with, with its ideas. But it does seem to me that if there has been a period where liberalism has been challenged, it is our period because I think it. I think it is. You know, it's often said in that sort of the that, that liberalism. It was the Conservative Party when it had its liberal economic ideas, and the Labour Party when it moved to adopt those kind of liberal centrist views. That was how they thrived, and that the the, the rejection of that through the Brexit referendum or through populism of left and right was a kind of correction against the hegemony of liberalism which was always resented by uh, the Liberal Democrats, feeling like they were, they were the real Liberals, even though that was only sometimes true. Um, I, I, it feels to me like a really difficult period for those who want to make the case for liberal ideas now. Um, and I wonder, from Vernon's much obviously deeper kind of cognizance of, of the historical parallels, if there are any, you know, what. What, what is the potential for us to restore ways of thinking uh, that value uh, that those liberal enlightenment um, norms held in institutions that are able to adapt and update themselves as time goes on? Um, I'm afraid I don't feel very optimistic about um, the British political system and the British constitution at the moment, but I would love it if Everybody else can tell me that I'm wrong. Okay. Thank you very much as well. <laughs> now, before I turn it over to the audience, is it Bern, um, Polly? I look at uh, a, a, a book, bookshelves full, and look at what your book talks about this, about the, the nature of the radical, and it was the, in, a, in local government, they were called progressives, I think, in, in, in London, not only in London. And 
um, <clears throat> the nature of progressive liberals um, uh, were seen as terrifically radical and enormously attacked by the conservatives and moderates of the day um, in a way that would, uh, you know, especially as towns and cities started to introduce what we've seen as today early stages of the welfare state at great cost to taxpayers. Um, when you look at these cartoons in Punch, there are loads, of, you'll, you'll see hundreds of them, they're enormously critical of this burgeoning local state, burgeoning what was the only part of the state other than uh, defence and foreign policy, really, at the time. So, given the radicalism of liberalism and this capacity to pick up issues which are highly recognisable today, concern about imperialism, willingness to shed uh, the colonies, or uh, beginning to talk about that. Um, what would today be seen as equalities issues, so they wouldn't have been called that at the time. <clears throat> I mean, those ideas, as I think your book by, is arguing, by implication, have just been taken in bits and chunks by the Conservative and Labour Party, and indeed the more contemporary Liberal Democrats, who've just shared them out in different mixtures. And, uh, that's, all, that's all that British politics is discussed. Is that true? You raised a very important issue, and uh, Polly's raised a huge number. As, as you say, the Liberals were very radical before 1914, but they were radical primarily on socio-economic matters, I think, rather than the Constitution. They were a very different party, although the Liberal Democrats descend from them in a way, they were a different party because they were a majority party in government, and they wanted to improve the machinery of government to get legislation through more rapidly. Uh, one block to that legislation, that, that hope, was the unreconstructed House of Lords, which had absolute powers till 1911. And therefore they restricted the powers of the House of Lords. Now, although the preamble to the Parliament Act talks about uh, eventually having a popular chamber, but not based on hereditary um, succession, in my personal opinion, uh, Asquith was not really very interested in that. It was put in to conciliate a few people who did want a directly elected chamber, like, say, Edward Gray, the Foreign Secretary. The vast majority of Liberals weren't, because they said to themselves, we just removed the veto of a chamber which didn't have much legitimacy because based on hereditary succession. The last thing we want is to give a veto to another chamber which has more legitimacy because based on direct election. And the people who wanted reform of the Lords were primarily the Conservatives. And similarly, the Liberals are also against the referendum. That was another main Conservative weapon um, uh, used against the Liberals. And the Conservatives said, uh, we, we want the referendum. The Liberals saw themselves as a majoritarian party, and they were not particularly interested in constitutional reform. And Asquith knows they were men of government, and they wanted to use government for um, social and economic uh, measures. On the... Um, point you make about imperialism. This is interesting because liberals are often called anti-imperial, but they weren't in the sense that they wanted to um, get rid of the empire. They didn't want it extended. What the, the liberal aim was to bring the colonies to self-government, but even quite advanced liberals didn't then believe that colonies, or India for that matter, composed of non-white people would be ready for self-government for very many years. And that was the view of the Labour Party as well, right through to the 1940s. But there should be improvements so that they would eventually become ready for that. And contrary to what's often said, most people in Britain were not interested in the empire. When they were asked in 1906 by the Conservatives to have a rise in the price of food for tariff reform, to hold the empire together, they voted strongly against it. And there was one survey done in 1949 asking people whether they could name a single colony. And about half of those asked could not answer, though one person said Lincolnshire. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, people were not interested in the empire. But um, although, as I said, the Liberals weren't interested in particularly in constitutional reform, it was a remarkably liberal society. And one area where I think what Polly says has a lot of resonance is in the area of immigration. And the 1905 Aliens Act, which was designed to keep out so-called aliens, primarily Jews from Russia and Poland, were actually a highly liberal measure which secured a right of asylum that anyone who could claim to be freeing from religious or political persecution 
it was automatically admitted to the country. And there were all sorts of appeals against anyone denied immigration. And no one suggested the sorts of things that are happening now of women and children being detained uh, as asylum seekers and so on, and whole groups of people stigmatized. It was a highly liberal um, uh, era from that point of view of, of, of tolerance, and very different from the continent in that way. Now, um, having criticized contemporary attitudes toward immigration, it's only fair to say how liberal Britain is compared with the continent by the numbers of members of ethnic minorities in the government and the numbers who were in the Conservative leadership election. A French friend of mine said that never happened in France. And Angela Merkel's last government in 2017 was entirely white. And we had by far the largest number of minority members in the European Parliament. Um, so I think that there is still a very strong feeling of, of liberalism in Britain um, the liberal culture still survives very uh, strongly. Okay, I'm going to come back to you in a second, Polly, on one issue. But one more to you, Ben. You talk in the book about the Fabians, and we are here at the London School of Economics and Political Science, and how the Fabians effectively operated as a, a sort of lobby group rather than, uh, they didn't immediately affiliate to the Labour Party, though they eventually did. And your, your description of this search for efficiency in government and the way the Fabians saw themselves is such a precise match, it seems to me, that it sort of begs the intriguing question, given the Fabians became a part, at least, of the intellectual base of the Labour Party, they were a much better fit for your version of liberalism, weren't they? Well, the, the leading Fabians themselves, people like the Webbs, were not the Liberals with a small L. They did not believe that working people um, were able to make decisions for themselves. But they said, and this is one stream, I think, of the LSE, and I think Beveridge shared it, that um, the experts were much better at making decisions for them than they were. And they did not like the National Insurance Act of Lloyd George and Churchill, because what they favoured was the reforms brought in by the Attlee government as a, a minimum as a, a minimum income as a right, minimum standard of living as a right. And some people have argued that just removes the incentives needed to make a welfare system effective. On the other hand, the Fab and also the Fabians and the Webbs, particularly, and Bernard Shaw were great imperialists on the grounds that larger states were more likely to become socialist and effective than really small units. But the main thing the Fabians did, which was to their credit, and it's very common to criticise them, in Dennis Healy's words, they brought the socialists down from cloud cuckoo land to reality. They actually had a programme of how some form of socialism could be established. And they were the main intellectual influence, I think, behind the 1945 Labour government, in my view, from which we're still suffering. I mean, Keir Starmer said we ought to look at the lessons of 1945 and my personal opinion, the main lesson is we shouldn't do things like that again. Okay. <laughs> um, to ask you, um, I've given you been name checked, Vince. Can I ask you to say a word <laughs> in a moment? But in a, I, just have, I want to ask Polly a question, then perhaps you to respond as well to this one, which is, there you are, you're, you're in government, perhaps unexpectedly in government, making policy, and you find yourself as a cabinet minister in government. <laughs> Radicalism, I think it's fair to say, is still a word that you can apply to this liberal position of the late 19th and early 20th century Britain, which contemporary liberal Democrats, some of them former liberals, would, I think, still be a word they'd associate with themselves, but correct me if I'm so radicalism, but very different to sort of Labour Party radicalism. Is that, am, I, am I right in reading that into the way the Liberal Democrats inherited? I think you're right. I think so the, pro the, pro Polly, the progress. Oh, sorry. I think. No, no, no. But you no, no, please, Polly. Polly. Um, so, uh, certainly. I mean, you know, uh, there are these competing traditions within the Liberal Democrats. Um, and, but, but every attempt to refer to the party as centrist would, will always be contested by a desire to be with the radical centre. Uh, and the, the polling research people would always tell us that radical is a terrible word that nobody likes and it sounds terribly scary. Uh, and, it, you know, it's been said, I can't remember by who, but that in the, in the 2019 election it was a sort of classic example of the Conservatives making radical ideas sound 
comfortable and safe, and the Labour Party making really quite timid ideas sound radical and scary. Mm. And as a result, uh, the election is. Um, uh, absolute, I mean, huge enthusiasm to be radical, but actually, um, and certainly as a, as a self-perception, uh, and, and there was that speech, and, and, and Nick, I, Nick felt quite a sense of regret having given it and promised a great reform act, and then been, I think, mocked quite widely in the papers, and, and having realised that doing so provoked a kind of immune response from the system. Mm. Uh, realised that the sort of speeches you would give in opposition when you're railing against the system sound very different when you're in a position of power and people think it's going to happen. Uh, but it's also worth observing that I remember at one point, I don't know, probably June 2010, I remember writing just a list of all the people we'd picked fights with. Uh, and, and it went on to a second page and thinking, this, have we got this right? I didn't get much further than that. But because you know you had the you know the, the academy reforms, and we're trying to sell off the forests, and you know just lists of all of this. Let's just tear up the systems and rules, um, and and actually, quite a lot of that founded because of the uh, because of the determination to do everything everywhere all at once, um, and I think actually the. The, the most successful radicals are the ones who are much more tactical. You know, it, it strikes me as a genuine political genius, right, to take a gay marriage um, and to split it into two things. A, a, a sort of big, radical, co sort of uh, constitutional almost thing about that, that, that triggers everybody's emotions. You cut it in half and have civil partnerships. No, it's just like a piece of paper, it's tidying up. And then once you've got civil partnerships, Oh, it's just tidying up because it's basically the same as marriage anyway. It's amazing to split it in half and make it two bits of nothing, um, and I, you get so much more done when you when you do it in that way. When you're willing to to turn things into bite-sized chunks, and we did almost none of that. The Conservatives did better, which is why more of their reforms, I'm afraid, went through and and lasted. Okay, I'll come back to you in a moment. Um, well, I, I just wanted to pose, pose a question, really, which is whether uh, Professor Begnador buys the argument, which you often hear, that the liberal culture was all, always had a fundamental fault line running through it, which was the, the social liberals, um, Hobhouse and then Lloyd George, eventually really just became social democrats uh, in almost everywhere. Uh, and on the other hand, the economic liberals who, in the British tradition, went through, I suppose, the Simonites, and then after the Second World War, Alan Peacock and the IEA, and eventually became the free market wing of the Tory party. And it was never a coherent concept for that reason, and probably the only country in the world where these two liberal traditions have coexisted is Canada, but that, that apart, the, the concept of a liberal culture, certainly in the economic and social sphere, never cohered. Okay. Well, I must let me say, if I'd known Vince Cave was in the audience, I didn't see him until I'd finished, I'd have been more cautious. But <laughs> the, 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 econ the economic liberals before 1914 were very weak indeed. There were some liberals who were opposed to the National Insurance Act and similar reforms, but they were a very small number and really played not an important role. They became important, I think, in the 20s and 30s, when, as it were, the Liberals, being a third party, had to choose whether they were closer to Labour or whether they were closer to the Conservatives. It's a much more modern debate, I think, but um, in a way, the whole progressive coalition split after the First World War and, I mean, Roy Jenkins and Blair, in their different ways, tried to reignite it, but probably both didn't, neither succeeded. But um, the Liberal Democrats are now, it, it, I mean, you, you may correct me on this, but the Liberal Democrats are now known, as, as Polly's indicators, party favouring various constitutional reforms. And I think many would find it difficult to know what their radical social and economic policies were. I'm not denying they may be there, but they're not as obviously at the centre of their thinking. Now, in the period we're talking about, constitutional reform was not a priority for liberals. At that time, liberals 
liberal leaders were strongly hostile to proportional representation. Gladstone had been, Asquith was, and Lloyd George was till the late 20s, till he was in, in the minority. And they also, when they had a large majority in 1906, they did not introduce a Home Rule Bill. They didn't want to be distracted by that. They wanted to get on with social and economic reforms. It was only in 1910, when you had a hung parliament, that they were dependent on the Irish, that they uh, introduced it. Uh, and the Liberals then were much more centred on the social and economic measures. And in a way, it's a tragedy for the country that it was, the progressive coalition was split in that way. And you had a party which, for many years, perhaps arguably still is dominated by the trade unions on the left, which wasn't the case with the progressives before the war. And the, the, the Liberals became a, a weak third party. Um, but I think we shouldn't read back uh, into the Liberals before 1914 what the Liberal Democrats are now, and vice versa. But, but I mean, you may think that's wrong. No, but it's still interesting to... Given your argument about the tradition surviving, the question of whether tradition has influenced the, the political parties today seems an inescapable yeah. question. But anyway, enough from me. Would anybody like to say something? Right. Would you like to say who you are? Um, uh, good evening. Anthony Teasdale. I'm a visiting professor in practice here at the LSE. Uh, thank you, Vernon, for a fascinating talk. And also, I think, congratulations on a book which has kind of restored um, a tradition which has otherwise been rather lacking from contemporary academia, namely the kind of elite political history. Um, I, I think you're unapologetic about that in your introduction. <laughs> I have a, a question or a, an observation leading to a question to ask you. I mean, obviously one of the central themes of this book is the versatility and also the resilience of the British political system against the conventional view that the country and by implication the constitution was on the verge of collapse before the uh, First World War. Do you think the electoral system, you've just alluded to the, a couple of the elections, uh, the electoral system helped or hindered uh, that um, versatility and resilience because you got, if I'm not mistaken, in, in, 90, in 1900 uh, a big conservative majority, in 1906 a big uh, liberal majority, uh, and in uh, 1910 in the two elections you got hung parliament. So it was a bit like having, I don't know, the 1983 uh, election followed by the 1997 election followed by the February and October 1974 elections. So how did the electoral system interact with the politics that you were describing? And then if I may, very briefly, a, a second question, which is you, you alluded to various constitutional reforms, for example, the House of Lords reform or a referendum. Did studying for researching and writing this book change your view about the validity of constitutional reforms today? Thank you. Um, that's a bit difficult questions to answer. Um, the electoral system then, before the First World War, swung until 1910 from one landslide to another on comparatively small shifts of the vote. I haven't got the precise figures here, but um, uh, you had much smaller swings than we're used to in recent years, but the swings led to very large landslide majorities because the Labour Conservative division between the war was very largely based, at least in the past, on, on class, so that the, 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 shall we say, the inner cities were strongly Labour and the rural areas strongly Conservative and the battle was really, I mean I'm oversimplifying in the suburban seats. Um, and, and therefore it, it was really very difficult to get a very large swing that would take away many of your seats. For example, in 1983, when the Labour Party got just 27% of the vote, it nevertheless got I think 209 seats because its vote was concentrated, whereas the Alliance, which got 25% of the vote, just 2% less, got 23 seats, because its support was even. Now, with the Liberals and Conservatives before the First World War, both of them had roughly even support across the country, or more even, and therefore you got very large uh, uh, changes of seats, so comparatively small swings. Now, whether that added to the stability of the country, well, you may say that, um, uh, with the large majority, the Liberals were in a good position to push through all their reforms. I think more important was that each side didn't think it should repeal the measures of the previous government, you should continue. So it wasn't such an adversarial system uh, as in the past. Um, 
and you, um, the resilience of the system and constitutional reform. Well, uh, I do think we're a very, today, I, uh, we're a very peculiar democracy, as we were then, in a way, because uh, we are one of three democracies without a constitution, and the others are, well, unusual, to say the least, of New Zealand, which has half the population of Greater London, and the Israelis are having a big debate now about the role of their courts, and they've been trying for many years to get a constitution, but never got there, but it's also a very different sort of society. I mean, we had a constitution when we were in the European Union, because there were lots of things that Parliament couldn't do, because of EU law, for example, restrict EU immigration. Now we're back to what you might call an elected dictatorship. And I think this didn't work as badly before the First World War as it does now, frankly. I think the divisions between the parties are rougher and more adversarial. And um, I think the, um, although I think on the whole, ethnic minorities can secure their rights through Parliament, I think it's very difficult for many unpopular minorities to get their rights. And therefore, I. I'm strong support of the Human Rights Act, and I'd strengthen it even further. I mean, to go back to something that Tony said, one good illustration of Britain's liberal culture, which I think is still there despite what I've said, is if you look at the interwar years, that when you had fascism and communism very strongly on the continent, and Britain had mass unemployment, how weak the extremist parties were. The communists never elected more than one or two MPs, and the fascists weren't, so we hear a lot about them, and, and lots of pictures on television, but they weren't strong enough to fight a general election. And they never, I think, won a local council election. They fought one or two by-elections, parliamentary by-elections, with no good results. Now, contrast that with 2010, when the British National Party got 2% of the vote. Um, and the British electorate were very, very mature at that time. And although there have been many criticisms of the Baldwin and Donald governments, they did make democracy work effectively, despite appalling conditions at home, mass unemployment and poverty and so on. And that, I think, is a good illustration of the strength of Britain's liberal culture. Very good. Question. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yes. My name's Robert Heath. I'm an LSE alumni from many decades ago. <laughs> um, I just wondered about the role of individuals in this, uh, in your period. I mean, you mentioned the House of Lords, its, its veto power was, 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 un, was changed in 1911. I mean, how much was it due to the fact they had individuals like Lord, Lord George putting forward his budget, which, if he hadn't done that, would, would there actually have been the change? How much was the individuals involved? Which brings me back to the present time with Polly was mentioning. Does it need a strong individual and plus circumstances to force through change? I wonder whether the House of Lords would veto power would have carried on for many more years if it hadn't have been for those circumstances in 1910-11. Thanks. I think in the long run, a chamber with a permanent one-party majority and unlimited power would be unacceptable. And um, they turned down, of course, the second Irish Home Rule Bill in 1893, which was another chance, in my opinion, to conciliate Ireland and keep her within the United Kingdom. And in his last speech in Parliament, Gladstone said the power of the House of Lords is a key issue which will have to be faced eventually. Now that government, the last Gladstone government, was very weak. It was a hung Parliament again. And uh, Home Rule was not perhaps popular in the country. And the, the Asquith government was very different. It had a large majority. And the, the um, uh, Lloyd George budget was, on the whole, very popular in the country because it was, well, that was increasing taxation. It was doing so for measures of social welfare. So I think eventually the Lord's absolute veto with a hereditary chamber with a permanent Conservative majority would have to go. If you look at the vote on the budget, it was 419 to 41. Now the government had only 41 supporters, though it had a vast majority of the Commons, so I think that wouldn't have worked. You mentioned the role of individuals, and that is a point worth making, that the um, political leaders there, and dare I say it in the company of Vince Cable, the MPs also, were giants compared with most of those today. And if you read the parliamentary debates and compare them with today's debates, you, you, you refute Darwin's theory of evolution. And the debates were of enormously high quality. The leaders were giants. I mean, Lord Salisbury, um, for example, was an amateur scientist who built his own laboratory at Hatfield. Balfour, the second prime minister of the period, um, 
uh, was, a, was a philosopher whose papers were published in academic journals and a very reflective, serious thinker. Campbell Bannerman uh, was, was rather different, but uh, Asquith was a very distinguished barrister and uh, in his spare time he used to read French novels in the originals, very conversant with English poetry and so on, extremely literate man. I mean, Lloyd George, clearly a great figure. Winston Churchill, the other lead, often forgotten, but as great a reformer as uh, Lord George. His unemployment insurance was the first such scheme in the world. The health insurance had been one in Germany. Unemployment insurance was the first one in the world. And he was a man of extraordinary energy. And by the time he got into Parliament in 1900, he'd written five books already at the age of 25. He then wrote, in his first period in Parliament, a two-volume scholarly biography of his father, which is still very important. Uh, work of, of scholarship, a man of tremendous energy and wide reading and learning and knowledge. And um, they, they were very great men. They were all men at that time, of course. But I mean, the, the leaders of suffragettes, I mean, particularly um, Mrs. Uh, Garrett Fawcett, also a remarkable a woman. Um, and um, uh, they were really giants compared with some of those, no names, but some of those we've had in recent years in number 10. <laughs> Just one thought, which is, that I think uh, Bernard's very compelling on the, the way in which constitutional reforms are not pursued, certainly in this period, out of principle or high principle, uh, but purposefully in order to get them out of the way because they're stopping something good from happening. And it, you know, it, it's interesting in the context of the Brexit debate where now that it's proved so rubbish, people are making the case that, oh, it was all a constitutional argument. It was all, it was all for sovereignty, as if sovereignty is enough. And actually, though, the, often people in politics or people who write learned theses uh, like to opine about um, the, you know, the, the injustices of uh, even the remaining hereditary peers or the, the, the injustices of a particular electoral system. In the end, all of that constitutional stuff, it, nobody ever cares about it. They, what they care about is what it enables or what it impedes. Um, and that, I think, is a, a, an important lesson for those, such as Liberal Democrats or you know, other parties as well, who seek to kind of win an electoral mandate on the back of simply the... Um, constitutional reforms which bore most normal humans. I mean, 1914 showed that we were part of Europe, as the Ukraine war has shown we're part of Europe, whether we're in the EU or not. Uh, and the reason that uh, both, uh, all the part, main political parties feel so strongly about Ukraine is they think, rightly in my view, that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a threat to Europe as a whole, and we are part of Europe. And that's what happened in 1914 with the invasion of Belgium, uh, that we are actually part of Europe. And... Um, but whatever the arrangement with the EU. Yes. Another female questioner at some point. Well, the suff the su otherwise, the suffragettes would have fought their battles. Yeah, yes. Well, I've got a male one as well, but it'd be nice to have a female questioner as well. Yeah. I'm not a female, I'm afraid, so you'll have to make do. Uh, I'm Mike, I'm the LSC. I'm a keen enthusiast on British political history. Uh, my question is whether 1945 was a turning point for British liberal history. Uh, obviously, by the end of the war, you, decolonization was beginning. Parliament was turning its attention away from foreign affairs to domestic affairs. Uh, majority Labour government, introduction of big welfare states instead of safety nets just for the poorest, and you know, most incredibly of all, post-war consensus. You know, both ch both sides of the house agreed on this and carried on. So, was that in some sense a decline of liberal thought of you know providing a safety net only for the poorest, not for everyone? A change in what our expectations of government is. I, th I think 1940 was the key date because it's often thought that the post-war reforms flowed from, as it were, the Labour government, but there would have been a health service with or without a Norrin Bev and the coalition government produced a white paper on that in 1944. It might have been a different sort of health service. In, in my view now, it would probably been a better health service, but that's another question. Uh, family allowances were introduced by the coalition government uh, the Education Act was introduced by the coalition government and of course the Beveridge Report which 
um, laid down the agenda for the um, government was, was um, put forward by, by Beveridge, of course, was a Liberal, sat on the Liberal benches briefly in the House of Lords. And in, in 1945, when he tried unsuccessfully to uh, retain his seat in Berwick-on-Tweed, one heckler shouted, am I voting for Churchill? And he said, well, when Churchill was a Liberal, you could have had both of us uh, without having to choose. And Beveridge's autobiography, incidentally, called Power and Influence, is well worth reading. We think of Beveridge as a rather dull, dry bureaucrat, which perhaps he was, but his book is, is, is enormously interesting and there's a great admiration for Churchill as a social reformer. And I think we would have had some sort of a welfare state, whoever had been in power. Of course, the Liberals were in the wartime coalition, though I think it's fair to say their influence wasn't greatest there. I think the leader, Archie Sinclair, was the Minister for the Air. Um, and I can't think of many liberal initiatives, but Beveridge, of course, and you may argue the two most influential post-19 political figures in Britain were both liberals, Beveridge and Keynes, and uh, neither of them in Parliament, except briefly Beveridge in the Commons, and then in the liberal bench in the Lords. Um, so um, it's a mistake to think that influence necessarily comes from being Prime Minister or having a key position in, in government. I would just add that there's plenty of of liberals of all, all parties, I think, who would argue that the welfare state, even in its broad construction, is a you know, a, a social liberal agenda, wouldn't wouldn't consider that the boundaries of liberalism stop before you get to a, a relatively universal welfare state. Um, but yeah, just because the boundaries of, of, of ideas go far beyond um, political parties. It always strikes me as, an, the, uh, I don't know, the, the, the least liberal part of the post-war reforms is nationalising development rights yeah. on land. And that's the only bit we haven't reformed, haven't really changed. Well, arguably the health service, you see, I mean, Lloyd George established a rather primitive internal market in the health service based on insurance and the participation of private and voluntary organisations. And it's arguably arguable now, I'm mean, with this a hindsight view, we might have a better health service today than if it was based on a nationalised hospital system and a system which the only way you could raise money for it was through taxation, where many voters, whatever they tell opinion polls, are unwilling to pay more in income tax. Mm -hmm. And this limits the amount of their funding available for the health it, service. Um, Nick Clegg's grandfather, I believe, was the editor of the British Medical Journal at the time, oh, argued well, vociferously yeah. against the statist model. What was his name? Do you know? Was it Clegg or something? Oh, I, don't know. I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. It's interesting because it was so used in... against him by the, just was used against him by left wing people as somehow his grandfather's opposition to the NHS was uh, was there's a bad a, thing. There's an intriguing counterfactual buried in this discussion and exchange, isn't there, which is had sort of this version of liberalism and perhaps a more minimal state. I mean, the idea, I think I'm right, in, I mean, give me, correct me if I've got this wrong, but the, the evolution of the early stages of what today would be seen as the welfare state, in part to stave off revolution, I always believe, but tell me I'm wrong about that, would have been a more minimal version. Beveridge's report, today seen as hugely important, actually, with, compared to the actual welfare state we have today, was a minimalist thing, of the most limited variety. So would a these, these liberal principles of this kind, other than the capital L liberal democrat, have led to a, a differently configured version. Uh, of, yes, uh, I don't mean to stave off resolution. A lot of the evidence we have shows that working people before the First World War were not particularly clamouring for a welfare state and indeed distrusted the state. No, I think it came from a general feeling that this was the right thing to do, justice, and that if you wanted an effective population, they needed better health care, better social welfare, and so on. In, in the Second World War, you, you make a good point about Beveridge, because he wasn't, um, uh, he wasn't a kind, the kindly Santa Claus, which people think. He uh, assumed and hoped that all benefits would be based on contributions. He said, or well, optimistically, benefits based on contributions is what the British people want, because that's the badge of citizenship. People shouldn't want something for nothing. There would be a small number of, as he thought, inadequates who rely on means-tested national systems, which he was very hostile to, but there were inevitably some inadequates. But anyone, I mean, he, anyone who, um, who could work but wasn't willing to do so, he was very tough. They should be sent compulsory to training camps and detention centres. The Web thought the same. 
uh, they, they were very tough and they weren't sentimental in any way. Now, as I say, the Labour Party moved away from that to a, a social minimum as a right, not based on contribution. I mean, national insurance is no longer, it's in effect a poll tax, it's not a, a wealth isn't based on, in general, on how much you've contributed. It's as a right. And um, we might have got a different welfare state in different circumstances, yes. And as you also imply, the state has been in a way of disappointment in the post-war years, and nationalisation has now broadly come to an end, except with the health service. Most of the other nationalised industries have gone, and it, it hasn't worked. In fact, that's the, one, the main part of the Attlee government's reforms that hasn't lasted. So the health service and the universities, of course. Gentlemen here. Hello. Thank you for your talk. I'm sorry I missed the early part of it, public transport being as it is. Um, I'm not sure that I buy into your thesis that Britain rose above extremist party offers in the uh, interwar period. Uh, the general strike very nearly succeeded, but for the betrayal by uh, the union leaders, I think J. Thomas famously said, uh, when Baldwin and his negotiators said, uh, uh, well, gentlemen, you won, but you've, you've now got to say what you're going to do. He said, at that point, I knew we were beaten. A man without any kind of program or, or set of demands before he goes in to negotiate. Dreadful betrayal. But it very nearly was a revolutionary period. Fascist groups were very strong in the 30s. Uh, public schools all over the place had thriving fascist societies. Um, they were quite well funded, particularly by the aristocracy, people like Lord Milton. Um, and it's largely by luck, as much as anything, rather than the lack of a, a, a fertile base that, that prevented repugnant views from uh, gaining sway. And I also think, uh, I know you've got a capital L in your talk, but I think that recently there has been a dreadful decline in small L liberal values of open debate and free expression. We now have cancel culture. We have uh, lecturers like Kathleen Stock being forced out of their job without being supported by the university employer. We have uh, JK Rowling being cancelled. Uh, we have climate change skeptics being denied a platform on the BBC. Uh, people like David Bellamy being cancelled and his programme being cancelled. Um, and it seems to me that free speech and open dialogue and inclusivity are all under dreadful attack. And there is a lack of defence of them. And I think the problem is getting worse. I trace it back to 1976 when the National Front attacked a public meeting in Manchester and the left went uh, all out leafleting universities everywhere arguing for a no platform policy and it started as no platform for fascists, it very quickly extended to no platform for racists, no platform for sexists, no platform for anybody that I don't like and the, uh, the number of groups got wider and wider and we are now seeing the results. And it started in 1976, in my estimation. So there are a lot of points there, but perhaps you'd like to respond. Okay. No, it's very... no, so, I, I have some sympathy with your last point. I've a lot of sympathy with that. I, I think it's true. That, but what you're talking about primarily occurs, not wholly, but primarily occurs, sadly, in the universities. And um, I think if you want a good discussion on Brexit, and I'm speaking with someone who voted Remain, I think if you want a good discussion on Brexit, you're more likely to get in, in, in your local pub than in many universities. I think that's a sad feature of British life and needs to be dealt with. I don't share your other points. I think the general strike was a miscalculation rather than a revolutionary attempt and could only succeed if it um, led to a revolution. But the Labour Party and the trade unions were not revolutionaries, nor were most of the people who went on strike. They went on strike to help the miners, but they miscalculated their means because it could be seen as a challenge to the democratically elected government. And that was the last thing the trade unions or the Labour Party wanted. On your point about fascism, I don't agree either, because although the fascists got a lot of publicity, they, as I said earlier, they didn't have the strength to fight a single parliamentary general election in a seat in the general election of 1935. 
and they never won, I think, a local council seat. They, they fought a few by-elections, local council by-elections, and got a fairly derisory vote. And as soon as the fascists took up anti-Semitism, I think they became pariahs in Britain because people would not support that. Even though there was social discrimination against Jews, people were not prepared to take away the political rights of Jews. And I think, yeah, I'm afraid another example of less tolerance comes in the Corbyn leadership, which led to 47% of Jews saying they would consider emigration if Corbyn won the election. And I think there is a great failure of, of many left liberals to condemn it sufficiently strongly. The Guardian, for example, treated it as a minor blemish on the progressive agenda. I uh, think it's much more than that. There, I think, Britain is, a, or certain elements on the left of the Labour Party, are much more illiberal than in the past. To, to that extent, I'd agree, but not about the interwar years. I think Britain was a very liberal society. Well, discussing the abdication, I can see if we go and look at that, about the aristocracy and all that. But anyway, let's move on to um, a question from Sudarshan Pujari. Immigration is nothing new to the UK, this is online, dating back, so immigration is nothing new to the UK, dating back to at least the imperial age, never threatened her liberalism. Why today is it testing liberalism? So that's a very good question indeed. And um, One can only say the rhetoric of politicians, I mean, it began with Enoch Powell. Um, and I suppose the rhetoric of politicians um, you got it. I mean, we've just been celebrating the 50th anniversary of the admission of Ugandan Asians into Britain, and you had the same rhetoric then, though, of course, anyone who follows Ugandan Asians realises the tremendous contribution they made. And it's the same rhetoric used about every uh, immigrant grouping Albanians today, um, Ugandan Asians in the past, Kenyan Asians, people in the Caribbean, Africa, Jews before that, no doubt Huguenots before that, and um, uh, it's, the, the rhetoric is much more unbalanced than it was at the period I'm writing about. I, mean, I was rather astonished reading about the Aliens Act of, 2000, of 1905 to find the generous things that people said about Jews at that time, uh, sort of shows an element of philo-Semitism in Britain. Um, but the, the rhetoric is, is much worse now, and one can only attribute it to uh, uh, political attitude, which is, which is uh, very unfortunate. I mean, there, there is also a question of acceleration, right, in the number of people who live outside their country of birth, which is now 350 million or something, and continues to grow. Um, I think it's we also the way we the way we count uh, ethnic minorities in the UK is that when uh, there are uh, interracial marriages and uh, mixed race children. They they add to the numbers, which gives uh, amazingly sort of fertile panic numbers for exactly the sort of the, the political and media rhetorics that, that Vernon talks about. Instead of us realizing that actually what that is is a measure of the the integration and the multiculturalism that in fact is a real strength of, of the country. I, I think though there's a there is a I mean a total failure for us to adapt to, um, I mean, at the very simplest building houses. You know, we have a, a university like this, a university like my own on the other side of the park, uh, brings in tens of thousands of international students, uh, and we do nothing to think about meeting the needs of these groups. We have a massive growing population. I'm hugely in favor of immigration. Um, but people need places to be, and we, uh, uh, you know, have a sort of reactionary approach to protecting the capital of homeowners uh, and this kind of unbelievable obsession with um, with the unearned wealth that is agglomerated into those people's homes. That I think impairs our ability to meet the needs of our growing population, and therefore it's. It's always easiest to blame that first and foremost on the other, on, on migrant groups. So I think there's, it's there's a, there's a, there's a, a positive, a positive aspect that the percentages who are opposed to interracial marriages is now infinitely yeah. small compared with the time of Enoch Powell. And how many people in Britain really either know or care that Rishi Sunak is a, a practicing Hindu? 
How many people in Britain know or care or worry about the fact that Sadiq Khan's a practicing Muslim? I mean, no one's interested. Mm. And they judge them by their performance. And um, we, we, yes, we, we, we've not done badly, I think, I'm on diversity. I mean, other people, other countries talk a lot about it. But we have practiced, dare I say it, particularly in the Conservative Party. It's the benefit of the uh, class hierarchy, is once you get into the uh, upper class. Well, I think, David, no, I think David Cameron did a lot to yeah. um, uh, make Conservatives more ethnically conscious and more conscious of the role of females as well. Okay, I can't stop thinking of one question. Yeah. Um, just Professor, sorry. I must say I was slightly surprised at um, your degree of optimism on the Ulster crisis in 1914. But, um, I mean, my take is, uh, would be to be more pessimistic and there was likely to be more of a bust up are uh, two grounds. One, the amount of weaponry that was quite openly flooding into the country, both north and south. And secondly, the personalities themselves. I'm thinking on the unionist side, Bonalore and Carson. And I think it strikes me that um, they weren't the sort of people who would be apt to compromise in the circumstances that you described. And that they, they wouldn't be looking at, say, a four out of nine county solution at all. There, there would have been a bust up, as you put it, in uh, Fermanagh and Tyrone. And as I said, I think the borders would have been decided by force. I don't think that would have had any resonance on this side of the Irish Sea. I think they'd have been left to fight it out. As to Bonnegore and Carson, I think they're much misunderstood. I think both were using extremist rhetoric to get a moderate solution. And Carson, in some ways, a rather typical barrister, he was using extreme rhetoric, but trying to get a settlement behind the scenes. And what they were, and Bonner Law was actually more moderate than many unionists, because he wasn't fighting home rule. He was just fighting for the exclusion of Ulster, which he'd won. Carson was, Carson was against the division of Ireland. He was an Irish unionist who sat for Dublin University, and he regarded partition as a failure, and indeed he hoped. And I think this might have come about the um, nationalist leaders, uh, particularly Redmond, who was an imperialist and very moderate, that they would govern in such a way the North would be happy to join them within a home rule system. Now, we don't know whether that would have happened, but they weren't, um, they weren't extremists in the sense they were going to fight for um, anything once exclusion was agreed, and in particular if it would aid Britain's foreign enemies, in particular Germany. So that, that's my basis of saying it. And as I say, when the war broke out, both Redmond and Carson, they almost formed a coalition, even though they couldn't agree on Tyrone and Fermanagh. Um, and as I say, I think that would have been settled probably by force. Um, as indeed it was, in a way, in the end, um, to some extent. But obviously we won't know. But the feeling, the feeling of gratitude towards the Liberal government was very, very strong amongst Irish the Irish people in general in 1914, to have home rule is symbolism of their own autonomy. It was very, very powerful. Um, but even if, I mean, it may have happened, you see, uh, one possibility is that a home rule Ireland would have moved peacefully towards an Irish free state by, say, about 1930, towards dominion status. But without the bloodshed of the Easter Rising, the guerrilla warfare, the black and tans, the civil war, and all the rest of it, and the war, there, in Ireland, it did radicalise it and create extremism, as it did on the continent in Germany and Austria and France and so on. Ireland it was radicalised for the war. England, the rest of the country wasn't. There. But we'll never know. You may be right. We'll never know. We're coming towards 8 o'clock. Can I ask a question? You, you make a point in the book about how the Whig tradition fell away, became a sort of conservative element in the liberal ideas and liberal worldview you, you, you're, you're un, un, describing here. So, but more generally, on the sort of progressive side of politics, liberal, labor, the liberal tradition, the liberal, liberal party, the labor party, um, arguably is more prone to factions and new ways of doing things, competing ideas to change the world. 
Whereas being on the Conservative, this is the wrong time to be saying this, because the Conservative Party is, as it happens as we speak, rather factional, but generally. If you're there as a Conservative force in politics, trying to, to preserve where we are, broadly things as they are, traditions and so on, in one, you know, in a coherent form as they are today, is that sort of part, is the, the sort of factionalism on the radical side of politics, the liberal side of politics, kind of go a little bit further to explain why the Conservatives are so successful over time? Yes, well, the Whigs were what uh, Vince Cable was speaking about earlier, like the Liberal Nationals of the 1930s. They thought the job of liberalism had been done and that the important thing was to preserve it against radical reforms. But on your larger question, David Butler, who died re very recently, once said to me the two most powerful figures in British politics were ghosts. The ghost of Robert Peel and the ghost of Ramsay MacDonald. And the ghost of Robert Peel says the Conservatives must never split, because when they did, they were in opposition for 27 years, I think it was. The ghost of Ramsay MacDonald says Labour should never, except in wartime, enter a coalition with another party, because they'll be uh, swallowed up. And I think this explains uh, a, a good deal of what you're talking about, these inherited party traditions. It's fair to say the Conservatives were not the majority party before the First World War, the Liberals were, and contrary to what many said, I think it would have been difficult to defeat them at the next election because you, the Conservatives, had to get more seats, not just than the Liberals, but also than the Labour Party, which won about 40 seats, and also the Irish Nationalists. Now, with Home Rule, the Irish Nationalists would be reduced in number, or Irish seats, to, from about 100 to 42, of which about 27, I think, would come from the South. So there's another 27, that's 67. So the Conservatives would need to get more than the Liberals, another, say, 80 seats, to get an overall majority, which wouldn't have been easy. And I think the Liberals are the majority party at that time. But, of course, after the war, because Labour, I think, excited many more fears than the Liberals have done. And the main fear people had about Liberals before the First World War was Home Rule. And it wasn't until they dropped that, in effect, in 1906 that they won. But people had many more fears about the Labour Party. The first was that they were communists, which a lot of people felt after 1980, Bolshevism. The second was the power of the trade unions. And then there was economic mismanagement in 1931 and 51. And then in 79, economic mismanagement and the power of the trade unions. And people tend to vote conservative when they're frightened. And people were much more frightened of the Labour Party than they were of the Liberals. I think, and this, I think, accounts for the fact that the Conservatives were the majority party after the First World War, but in my view, the Liberals were before the First World War. Though the Liberals also made a mistake, this is one area we haven't talked about, in not giving the vote to women. And, uh, the main suffragette movement, the NUWSS, supported the Labour Party from 1912 because Asquith was so hostile to female suffrage. and. Um, women became very much voluntary supporters and workers of the Labour Party. And after the First War, women on the, the progressive side were much more likely to support the Labour Party than they were the Liberals. Though most women, it's fair to say, supported the Conservatives. And it's fairly clear that if women hadn't got the vote, the Conservatives would not have been the majority party for so long, because women were less likely to be trade unionists, and therefore more, li more likely to be churchgoers, and therefore more likely to vote Conservative. Till about the late 1970s, the gender gap favoured the Conservatives. <laughs> Ollie's final thought from you on, on, on um, the word liberal. I mean, I'm intrigued by the word liberal, if I'm honest, because you've used it in this book, Vernon's used the word liberal in this book, as a sort of very positive word, a sort of a, a coherent, progressive worldview that can feed into a party's politics or several parties' politics. But I think you'd have to say that in Bernard's book, it's a positive word. And yet the word liberal, I mean, and then there's the Liberal Party or the Liberal Democrats, capital L. But the word liberal is often used quite pejoratively in politics from the left and the right of what otherwise can be seen. And, you know, people who think of themselves as liberals are proud of it. But people on both sides, left and right, often use the word liberal, lowercase l, as a bit of a pejorative word. Or am I misjudging the word? Is, am I putting too much meaning on a word? I mean, I, it is used as a term of abuse much more in the United States. That's certainly true. And it is increasingly the case that the words 
bleed their media across from the United States. It, you know, you hear people talking about BIPOC, for example, with, uh, uh, black, indigenous, and people of color, which doesn't make sense in the UK context because who were the indigenous people? Uh, uh, and, and yet, it, so the, the kind of cultural, particularly on the progressive uh, side. Um, so I think that's probably part of it. It means all sorts of different things. As you know, Vince articulated earlier, the social liberal, the economically liberal, and you've got libertarians, uh, and then you've got neoliberals, which I, I struggle to define, but I think seems to mean people who call themselves liberal who I don't like. Um, uh, but perhaps there's more to it than that. Um, uh, so, you know, people compete over the meaning of words, and I, I think that is always going to be the case. But there is a sense, certainly for, for the, the, the tradition that I value, is that idea of both uh, you know, the kind of enlightenment values and the, the freedoms um, to, of the individual, but also recognizing the value of the state in its active role to liberate people, which I think is what you know, social liberals have tended to focus on, which is why, in my view, the welfare state is, is and can be uh, an act of a, a liberating a liberal government but sure i mean you know tory quaker like all of these words you know if you hate people then then you use them pejoratively what does woke mean maybe we can come back in a couple that's, of that's decades that's on another evening ask um, that question but it's, a, it's a perfectly respectable question we'll do it on another evening i wouldn't want to cancel that discussion <laughs> Vernon, just finally, finally, what about, uh, am I putting too much meaning on, I, I detect, you wouldn't have written this book if you were not enthusiastic about the notion of the version of liberalism which you're describing as having, a bi uh, having survived, am I right? Well, the enthusiasm is a consequence of the book, not a cause. I honestly have to confess, when I started writing it, I didn't know what I thought, and I can honestly say that my conclusion which I think would have surprised me at the beginning, derived from reading the evidence, in particular the parliamentary debates and um, speeches of the leaders and state documents and so on. I was very surprised on the whole by what I found, I have to say. And I think a lot of the discussion and books on this uh, hadn't got it right for that reason. They haven't, haven't gone into it um, in enough detail. A lot of the devil of history lies in the detail. So it's a consequence that I came to appreciate the strength of Britain's liberal culture. That is a, an entirely rationalist, <laughs> enlightenment way to end the evening. <laughs> <laughs> through rational research, we shall find answers. Uh, I'd like to thank Polly and Vernon for uh, engaging so fully in this wide-ranging debate on you know, a period of Britain's history, which I think, I mean, the book makes this point very clearly, has influenced all the major political parties as a tradition that you can visibly see in members of certainly the Conservative, Labour and Liberal Democrat parties, arguably others besides in the UK, a particular version of British liberalism. So thank both of you, and I'd like to thank everybody in the audience. If you want to come and have a conversation with our two guests, I'm sure you would be uh, welcome and welcome so to do. And as I said earlier, feel free being encouraged to buy the book. Very good value. Uh, <laughs> the loss of it, which is a good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.